in Dorset. Um, this is where I live. I got into this because uh, there was a project in Dorchester to commemorate the end of the war in 1918, and Dorchester was a major military base with a barracks uh, and uh, a lot of parade grounds and training facilities. And uh, it struck me that it would be nice to actually look at conscientious objectors as part of the project to commemorate the end of the war. So I got involved in a group that was doing that, and I only found one CO from Dorchester. So I then widened out the research. So conscientious objectors in World War One. It was freedom of thought. conscience or religion, very wide base. Um, okay, John. Next slide. Okay, these are just a few statements from some of the Dorset CEOs. Uh, I won't read them all out. Uh, most of the ones I came across were uh, um, religious based, very often scripture, but not necessarily. There are two statements there. Uh, one from a Wesleyan Methodist, all human life is sacred. And uh, Jay Watts said, I cannot take part in the destruction of human life. Um, so there's a whole lot, just a simple Christian, grounds of scripture. Um, and I quite liked A. Kersley, I'm conscious of being held under the influence of a mighty spirit force, and the cutting of these anchor lines would seal my soul to their government. Um, very, very powerful statements. A um, little bit about the military service tribunals, um, which Lois has touched on. Um, in Dorset, there were quite a lot of them. Um, one of the difficulties with researching COs is that all the records from the military service tribunals were destroyed in 1921 by order of the government, apart from two. Um, so we don't have the military service tribunal records. I got this information from going through uh, the local newspaper. I went through every single edition and they reported on the military service tribunals, but they didn't report on every single one. So on the tribunals, there were generally businessmen and landowners. This is in Dorset with a few politicians and councillors, plus a military representative who would put the army case. In Dorset, there was one tribunal per town, plus a number in the rural districts, but I don't know exactly how many, because the records have gone. Um, I couldn't find them. There was also, if you wanted to appeal, there was an appeal uh, procedure, and you appealed to the Dorset County Appeals Tribunals, um, they held, uh, they seem to meet nearly every week um, or sometimes twice a week uh, or sometimes fortnightly. Um, when people were not granted exemption, they were generally sent to Weymouth to um, be signed up. And uh, Here's one or two examples of them. This is George Stevens Abbott, uh, partner in the Bridport building firm. He was very typical. When he failed to report um, to the barracks, he was arrested. He was sentenced in the magistrate's court and fined. He was told to go to the 3rd Battalion of the Dorset Regiment. He refused to put a uniform on, and that was a key thing. The COs who um, refused were told to put a uniform on. That refusal was failure to obey an order, and that was a court martial. Um, so he was court martialed. He got a year's sentence, but he uh, did accept work on the Home Office scheme when that came in. Um, I found some grounds for appeal. Um, and these are a couple of typical ones. Uh, w. Rose, um, 
he was the only one left out of six that was six employees and his employer couldn't replace him uh, t whiteman said um if you take my employee, I will have to close two shops and I won't have a carpenter for my farm. So the grounds for appeal were generally made not only by the um, person claiming exemption, but also by employers and also by family members. Uh, several mothers um, were recorded in the newspaper. An interesting quote from the army representative at the appeals tribunal on COs. They gave more trouble than 10 ordinary fellows. Thank you. Next slide, please. Um, okay, these are just three points. Uh, they're kind of random because the only information was whatever the newspaper chose to report. Um, I didn't make records of these and I wish I had, so I might go back sometime, but there were some verbatim reports from a journalist who uh, just had um, tribunal members joking about the people in front of them, um, joking about how, uh, how they would be perfectly good in the army or how they didn't have the intelligence to realize they had to go into the army that kind of thing um, however the there was uh, in Dorset there was a kind of recognition that these people were genuine and even the new MP in 1917 um, supported those with a genuine conviction uh, again a, a one interesting thing in August um what you could do you could find a substitute to go for you and that was allowed uh, i don't know whether that applied in the rest of the country but in dorset you could get a substitute um, but in 2017 you couldn't do that if it was people employed in agriculture so they then started taking married men this is the ongoing change in regulations the whole of Cranbourne, which is a small town in the east of Dorset, resigned as it was useless to meet. They would be unable to get people to um, sign up. Okay, next slide. Uh, these are a few numbers. Um, they're changing all the time, but it gives um, a kind of picture. Uh, 800,000 people. These are very broad global general figures. Um, Cyril may um, have more up-to-date ones. About 800,000 people claimed exemption once they were called up. About 20,000 of those 800,000 were um, claiming exemption on conscientious objection grounds. Uh, about 20,000 agreed to work of national importance. So. Uh, sorry, about 18 to 19,000. So the absolutist um, was a very tiny percentage, I think, of the total COs. Um, now we come on to Dorset. Um, I could find 65 conscientious objectors from Dorset. Most of them were early on in 1916. And going back to an earlier question, of those 65, only two were granted absolute exemption. All the rest were um, sent it to the military. Um, the kind of people there were, I found 14 religious associations and there's some of them. Um, the kind of occupations listed in the paper, most people who were claiming exemption were on conscientious grounds, were semi-skilled or skilled. And they're typical um, occupations, foreman, schoolmaster, shop manager. Uh, one person of high status was the Dorchester um, CEO. He was a surveyor of taxis, which the modern equivalent is a tax inspector. Um, he was a Christadelphian. Um, I'll come on to Christadelphians in 
uh, this slide now. Thank you. John. Okay, Christadelphians is very interesting. Um, they serve only the Lord Jesus Christ and would not engage in the politics of the world. And they're a, a church organization. Right when the war started, as soon as it started, they petitioned um, against conscription before conscription came in, two years before. And before conscription came in, the war office had already accepted their register of church members and told tribunals to grant total exemption for Christadelphians on the list of church members. So they had all agreed to take work of national importance. And it's interesting, they're the only group that had this status of automatic exemption from military service. Um, although the London Standard did refer to Quakers um, as well. Um, again, this is a, one of the views. The CO is nearly always a pious fraud and a contemptible humbug, but not Quakers or Christadelphians. Very interesting um, that because they'd spent two years working with the War Office, they got that uh, exemption. Okay, next slide. Um, again, this is uh, just picking up on the things Lois mentioned. Uh, there were standard sentences a year, which was generally commuted to 112 days. Um, we've touched on that before. Now I want to come on to Dorchester Prison. Um, Dorchester Prison uh, became a holding prison for men from Weston, which was the barracks at Weymouth, just down the road. Uh, I found um, the problem is the registers from the prison have been lost or destroyed. So I, it's very difficult to get information. I did find 93 names of people held in the prison, 60 of which were sent up from Weymouth. Generally, they only stayed a very short time, but some stayed a long time. Um, Nearly all the people from March 6, 1916 onwards in the prison were COs, apart from some inebriates, which had their own little section. And generally there was between 20 and 80 prisoners in there. Uh, they had a Esperanto magazine, which is very interesting. I couldn't find any outstanding copies of it, but it obviously was very highly regarded. Um, that picture on the left hand is one of the cells in the prison. Uh, it gives an idea of what it would have been like to have had to stay there. Okay, next slide. Um, I did find the visiting committee um, book. Uh, every prison had a visiting committee and somebody went into Dorchester prison every week, sometimes twice a week. Uh, in the complaint section, there were very, very few complaints. And these were the main complaints about food, which uh, wasn't enough, and cold, being cold at night. Uh, all the entrants that said they were cold at night, the next week, it always said they were given an extra blanket. Um, the impression I got from the visitors book, the visiting committee book, was that conditions in Dorchester were pretty good uh, and not, there was no examples of bad treatment. I'll come on to that now. Um, Wilfred Littleboy was held in the prison for over two years. Um, he's one of the more well-known COs. Um, and these are some of his comments. Um, there's an hour and a half interview with him that's available from the Imperial War Museum and Peace Pledge Union. And this year, his letters from prison have just been published. Uh, so uh, unlike some of the bad treatments we read about, I don't, there's no evidence for that in Dorchester. Uh, prisoners uh, were allowed to talk together they had could obtain books and in his letters he lists it's hundreds of books he'd read 
uh, all sorts of books, socialist books, religious books, history books, economics books, all sorts. Uh, visiting Chaplin came, um, Quakers from Bournemouth came every week for a meeting for worship. These are just some facts about the end of the war and the end of conscription, including a very good pub quiz. When did uh, World War I finish? It was 1921, um, was the official cessation of hostilities. And COs were denied the right to vote till five years, uh, 1926. But again, it's, I think it's indicative. There were some bad stories, but that right to vote denial wasn't generally enforced. And we've already seen the um, Walsh Rails being elected as a councillor and indeed as an MP during that period. Um, okay, the final slide now. Um, okay, Dorchester was, Dorset was quite a major place for people from all over the UK to be sent. 25% of the 2000 odd absolutists were held in Dorchester prison at some point, even for a day. Uh, Dorset was, I uh, tried to, um, see how Dorset compared with the rest of the country. Um, the applicants to tribunals was in line with other places throughout Britain as people applying for exemption, um, family or business hardship, but virtually all the applications were refused. Uh, there were virtually none where the tri that reported that the tribunal accepted the um, application. Uh, quite a lot were granted leave, so they were said, yes, you must serve, but you've got three months to sort out your affairs or whatever. Um, and they often accepted a substitute. Uh, however, Dorset was very different. Uh, there were 65 I found on a population pro rata figure, it would have been double that. And for the absolutists, there would have been at least double the two I found, maybe as many as 70. Dorset's a very rural area in 1916. They had a number of military bases, uh, air um, the prototype air force, the army and the navy. It had a semi-feudal um, agricultural system with landed estates and uh, people would have been generally conservative and not want to upset their landlord or their um, employer. Um, anyway, that concludes the bits and pieces I've got in this short presentation. I hope it's been interesting. <laughs>